Today we're going to talk about, have you ever asked God for anything? Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. How many people have ever asked God for something? Yeah. Now, if your hand's not up, you're either sleeping or you're lying. <laughs> and may the fleas of a thousand camels rest in your bed tonight. Don't mess with pastor on Sunday morning. Let's see, how many people have ever asked God for something? Let's see your hands. I'm looking, I'm looking. All of us. How many people, put your hands up, how many people have asked God and still haven't yet received and it didn't work the way you thought? It'll happen, does, does it not? We're growing. Say, I'm growing. See, a lot of times we get frustrated if we're not perfect, not realizing that we're to grow in the grace, grow in knowledge. Jesus grew, the Bible says, in the knowledge of God. He grew in the grace of God. He grew in the stature of God. So if Jesus had to grow, we have to grow. So I don't get offended at that. I, get a, I, I personally take an offense when someone acts like they know everything. It's like, wait a minute. No one's perfect except for Jesus. Say that with me. Say, nobody's perfect but Jesus. And so the first time you ask or pray and you don't get an answer, it's not God's fault. Don't blame the Bible. Don't blame God. Maybe we can, and I encourage all of us to be this way, pause and be thick-skinned enough to say, Lord, is there something I need to do differently? If God watches over his word to perform it, and that's what the Bible says, if heaven and earth will pass away before his word fails, if Isaiah 55, 11 is true that God's word goes forth, it will not return void. If Jesus said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. If this is what's in the Bible and it didn't work, maybe it's not God, maybe it's something I need to learn. And that's even for me. That's why Jesus said, seek first or make a priority of the kingdom of God, Matthew. Uh, and all these things will be added because there's a priority learning how the king does stuff. And so today we're starting a new series on the name of Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus', Jesus name is not a, uh, some crazy phrase. It's not some lamp that's to be rubbed three times to get a genie. It's, it's not a... a uh, something like that, like a rabbit's foot, good luck charm. There is purpose, there is power, there is position. There's a lot of stuff where you talk about the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus enables us to defeat the enemy. The name, the name of Jesus helps us move into the presence of God. The name of Jesus helps us be saved. The name of Jesus, we go on and on. And today we're going to talk about how the name of Jesus helps us in our prayers. And the, t the title of today's message is... Improving your ask. Improving your ask. Because if I'm asking, maybe I'm not asking correctly. I want to learn. How many people, if there's a way, something we can learn from the Bible that will help us improve our ask when we ask the Father, I want to know. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm improving my ask. <laughs> Let's begin with prayer. Father, I thank you for your word, your truth today. We set everything aside right now, all distractions, all plans, all decisions, all future things, all past things, any offenses, any worries, anything the devil would try to use to distract us, to keep us from hearing and receiving from you. And Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice that we would have and receive right now the anointing of understanding, that we would have that understanding of your word today, that the word will go into our heart and produce results that cannot be denied, cannot be delayed, cannot be deterred by enemies, by the devil, by no one. We thank you. We look to you for strength and guidance and direction. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, for the good things that you are doing. For you are good. There's none like you. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. What we have to understand in the Gospel of John chapter 15, and challenge everything I say with the Word of God, it's not my words, it's God's Word that makes the difference. I want you to grow. For that to happen, I need you to challenge and dig and search on your own. Get deeper in the Word of God. But a lot of people think that if we're not careful, we'll allow what I call religion to get into our relationship with Jesus. And if you're a guest, I don't mean to offend, but the reality in my perspective, and if you don't agree, just pray for me, is that religion is, is man's controlling what the Bible says. Men creating an ideology, forcing other people to follow a pattern that maybe it's not in the Word of God. Because there's, some people can't tell me what the Bible says, but they can tell me what the doctrine of the church is. 
but I'm here to tell you that there is doctrine of the church, but there's also, the Bible says, doctrines of devils. That the devil will creep in with doctrine, ideology, and it was of such nature that even in the day of Jesus' ministry, he warned the disciples, people that were full-time, totally committed to him and ministry and were under his teaching day in, day out, even under that type of situation, he warned the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They looked at him and they dawned upon and had a conversation amongst themselves and said, what do you think he meant? Leaven, that means bread. Maybe he's telling us that we need to make sure we take enough bread. And he, he, Jesus came back into their conversation said, no, guys, you're missing it. Beware of the teaching. Because just because someone is saying it doesn't make it true. They might have a title, they might have a collar, they might have their own TV channel, but if it's not in line with the Word of God, challenge everything to the Word of God. They might say they're a prophet, and they may be, but that doesn't mean they're always right. Challenge the, even the, the, what someone says to you, challenge everything with the Word of God. Can I get an amen? Doctrines or teachings that are out there don't make them always true. And, and one teaching is out there that it, it creates a, almost a mindset that if you ask God for something, it's almost an obligation and inconvenience to bother God. I won't bother God with that. That's too small. He don't have time for that. There's other bigger things he needs to deal with. I'll work on that myself. I'll, I'll handle that. I don't need to bother God because, you know, if I approach God, I have to do it almost in a, in a I'm sorry to bother you. Do you got a, do you got a quick moment in just prayer? Can I, can I mention this to you? And if you got time, maybe you can deal with this for me. Listen, are you listening to me? Your father loves you so much. He's not inconvenienced by a moment of your time. He loves you so much. In fact, if you look at the Gospel of John chapter 15, and this is, write it down, we won't put it on the screen. It talks about, in verse 60, that what gives glory to your Father, oh, I know what he's going to say because I've heard it before, what gives glory to God is that when I suffer, that's not in the Bible. You know what gives glory to your Father, according to the Bible, is that your prayer is being answered. Because it's all talking about prayer, producing fruit. And this is what gives glory to your Father, that you produce much fruit. And that whole context of that fruit in John 15 is talking about prayer. Say, my Heavenly Father, my heavenly Father wants, me wants me to ask. He delights when you spend time with Him. Amen. Not just always asking something, but when you ask, it, He's not offended by that. Right. He delights in answering your prayers. Can I get an Amen. Thank you for the five people that agree with that. The rest of you, you might struggle tonight when you get the fleas of the thousand camels in your bed. Don't miss them. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, I won't read it right now, but there's a story. And many of us have heard it if you've been in the church for any length of time. But it's the story, the parable, Jesus talked in parables, the parable or the story of the prodigal son. Have you heard this before? In the context of the story, it talks about a father who was generous, a father who had a, a big organization, a father who had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, give me the inheritance that belongs to me, this Greg Bruce translation, please challenge it, give me the inheritance that belongs to me, and the father gave it to him, and he went off and left the father. He left the house, he left the job, he left his role, he left his responsibility, he left everything that represented the Father. He wanted to do it his way. Have you ever been in a place in life, and I don't mean to go down this road in preaching, but since we're here, have you ever gone down the place of life and all you wanted to do is not what God asked you to do, this is my life, I'll do it my way. God asked you to do something, I don't got time for that, I got my own plans. Give here. I don't need to give, that's my money, I'll, I'll decide. You don't, you don't tell me to give, it's my money, I'm not, I can go buy something for me. And the, the prodigal son, the youngest son, learned over the process of time when the money ran out, friends ran out, opportunities came unexpected that brought storms that he didn't realize, and he found himself with no one, and somebody hired him, and all the job he could get was feeding pigs, which means not much besides a bad case scenario for us, but there's so much depth in this parable, because the truth being told, pigs or swine is something that they wouldn't even touch. And he found himself one day, because of sin, feeding what he would before walked away from. Yeah. And he came to himself, the Bible says, and when he came to himself, he, he 
begin to perceive and understand the reality of who he is compared to the relationship of his father. And he said to himself, my father has servants. He has employees that have plenty. Why am I starving here? I'm so hungry that, I, that what the pigs are eating are looking good to me. And he came to himself with the reality of, I don't need to live at this level. That my father was right, I was wrong, and what I did my way didn't bring what I thought it would bring to me. It only brought me heart. And can I get an amen? Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing to pay. I need to go back to my father. And he, and he went back to his father and he said, Father, I have sinned under heaven unto you, and I don't deserve to be your son. I'll be, a, I'll be an employee. I'll be a servant. Accept me back. And the father reached out and, uh, and hugged him on this journey. Didn't even wait. Didn't even answer back. Hugged him and so, told the servants, put a, put a robe on his back, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. All those symbolizing something amazing, but we don't have time today. And then he said, get the fatted calf. Get the special one that we've been raising for a special event. And let's slaughter. Let's kill that animal. And let's begin to celebrate. For my son who was dead is now alive. That is one of the parables that is a great storyline. It is a great direction for salvation, for soul winning, and has been preached and preached. But one thing that I think we miss out is the continuation of that. Because today I don't want to talk about those who have left and, and prayerfully down the road come back. Today I want to talk about those who never left. Because there was an older brother who never left the father. And the older brother had a perspective that when he, heard the, when he came in from his job that day and he heard the celebration at, the, at his father's house and he asked one of the servants, he didn't even ask the father, what is going on? And the servant knew what the son should have already been experiencing. The servant knew about what was happening. The son had lost his position. He didn't even realize what was happening. Didn't Jesus say to the disciples one day, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends because a servant doesn't know what his master does. And he said, what is going on? He said, there's a, there's a party, your younger brother has come back and your father's throwing a party. And instead of celebrating like the family, instead of celebrating like his father, instead of celebrating like the other people that were a part of the organization, he began to get angry and offended at the brother and at the father. Boy, we can preach all day on that. Because when people come back that you don't think deserve to come back, they've hurt me. They don't deserve any mercy. They need a little judgment. We have to make sure we embrace those. Because the Bible says heaven celebrates every time one person repents and comes back. But I'm not here today to talk about the attitude of the second older brother. I want to talk about the problem of the older brother, of the attitude, his thinking that kept him away from receiving what belonged to him. We pick up in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, if you have your Bible, verse 29. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve you, verse 29 and verse 31. And lo, these many years do I what? Stay with me. This, these many years I do what? This, these many years I do what? Serve. These many years do I serve you, neither transgressed I at any time at your commandment. Yet you never gave me a kid, which is a little, little goat, a little, little animal. You didn't give me a, a, a little kid that I might make merry with my friends. What was the problem? One of the problems he had was he had a mentality of a servant. Second problem he had is that he had a mentality of not asking. He said, I've been around, you didn't give me anything. I've been around, you didn't offer anything. And the Father, two things that will help us in our attitude in our walk with God, because some of us have been in church so long that we think that God owes us. Now let's move on. Well, I didn't go see the X-rated movie like those people down the road. I should get, you owe me. Verse 31, and he said unto his son, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. All that I have is yours. Two things I want you to write down to help improve your ask. Number one, we have to ask. John 16, 
Verse 23 and 24 says, In that day, shall, Jesus said, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. God wants you to ask and he wants you to ask because he wants you to have some joy. Well, it's not life threatening. It doesn't have to be life threatening. He wants you to be happy. Come on, somebody. He, he, God said, uh, ask, I want you to ask so I can give it to you so that your joy, do you, look at that, that your joy. God will do stuff for you just to ha so you have a happy day that day. That's not what I was taught growing up. I was taught that God only answers the big problems, life and death problems, OMG problems. And if you don't expect God to solve the little problems, why do you think you can have faith for a big problem? God will solve problems not because life uh, depends on it. He'll do it because he wants to see you smile that day. It, it gives joy to the Father to see joy in the... Come on, think about it. You like to give your, your children stuff on Christmas or whenever because you like to see them light up and be happy. And what does it do? It does more for you than them. And the Bible says, if you who are evil know how to do good gifts and good, give good things to your children, how much more your father, which is in heaven. Jesus said in John 15, we referenced this earlier, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit shall remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Why? Because he wants me happy. Come on, somebody. I want you to know your Heavenly Father loves you. It, it, it's not all about everything else, and it can include those everything else, but you have to come to the root thing that your Heavenly Father loves you. If you're not in the in place of that He loves you, do you know what you do? You get into the place of bartering, trying to earn what He's already provided. Say, so He loves me. God doesn't mind you having things. He just doesn't want things to have you. I mean, Jesus still has to be the priority. Do you hear me? Because you can have everything the world offers, but if you're, you lose your soul, you lose out. It's a bad deal. You, because there's people in the world who have stuff. They look on the surface to have everything. But when they lay their head on the pillow at night, they are empty on the inside. And they're wondering, what's going on? I have what the world says is what makes you happy. They have all the cars and, the, and all the fame and all the followers and all the YouTube subscribers and everything that people strive for. But they look and they're still empty because on the depths of on the inside, it can't be filled up by stuff on the outside. It can only be filled up with Jesus. Say, Jesus loves me. God doesn't mind you having stuff. Even Paul told Timothy, listen, Timothy, tell those who have worldly wealth not to trust in those uncertain riches, but a living God who richly gives you all things to enjoy. Check it out. Check it out. So God, can you imagine? You say, but God, I don't need that. God said, yeah, you don't need it, but I want to give it to you. See, God wants me to be happy. I know that's a lot of teaching in that. God doesn't care about your happiness. He just cares about your faithfulness. Well, the Bible says he wants me to be happy. No, that doesn't mean sin because that will take you out of the joy of the Lord. Can I get an amen? But if you think your father does, Heavenly Father doesn't care about you smiling and saying, thank you, Father, for that. I didn't expect that. Lord, I thank you for answering that prayer. That was just... You serve an over-the-top God. And there's scripture after scripture. James says, you have not because you ask not. Then he goes on and says, you, and even when you ask, you don't get it. Because when you ask, you ask amiss, which means you miss the target. Because all you're doing is praying just for what you want. See, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will. See, if all we're doing is just is about our own personal consumption, if, then we're still buying into the system. And God wants you to ask. He doesn't mind you asking for stuff. Stay with me. But if you're asking for stuff so that you can get what only God can give you. Let me say that again. If you are asking for stuff because you think it will give you only what God can give you. Because in your mind, if I get that car, if I get that relationship, if I get that house, if I get that stuff, if I get that job, if I get that raise, I'll be happy. And the only, the truest happiness comes from God. Do you hear me? 
God operates by his system, so you can't ask God to give you something to take the place of him. He don't mind you asking stuff, and he loves giving you stuff, but this stuff has to be in context of your understanding of priority and importance. And when you, when you don't handle things that are important correctly, you lose them. This is important. Listen to me. Listen. There are things in life that people miss out because they mishandle important things. If you don't handle your marriage correctly, if you don't treat it with the importance it is, you'll, you'll mess up and lose your marriage. If you don't handle money correctly because money's important, you don't, don't let the people in the church history tell you, money's evil. No, no, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is important. When you go to pay your bills, when you go to buy your family something, when you're going to spread the gospel, because the gospel doesn't lack power, it lacks the ability to propel it, which is needful for us to participate in sending it. Money is important. Marriage is important. Friendships are important. Careers are important. Education is important. When you don't handle things that are important correctly, they diminish. You lose them. But here's the problem. Here's the flip side. Important things all want to be priority. Important things, no matter what it is, has within its innate DNA, you can call it, the desire to be a priority. So money is important, but money wants to be number one. Friendships are important. But there will come a crossroad opportunity where they will challenge you because even friendships, marriage, family, want the desire. It's in it to be number one. That's why Jesus said that if you love anything, anyone above me, you're not worthy of me. It's not that you should hate people or hate money or hate your spouse. No, you should love and cherish and nurture and build that relationship. It's, say, it's important. It's important. it's important. it's important. But never let it be the priority. Because number one priority is Jesus. Okay, I don't know how we got down that road. So number one, say ask. I have to ask. Say I have to ask. Number two, and this is where we're going to. Hang our hat for the rest of the time. We must ask, are you ready? We must ask for what we already own. Here's where it gets a little, little okay, say that again. I, I'm not too sure how that works out. Stay with me. And here's a key element to the, the name of Jesus and the power of the name of Jesus. Because it's not a, you pray just what you want and do your own thing and then tag on the name of Jesus. And we're twisting the arm of God and making it. It don't work that way. It don't work that way. That's why you have to spend time abiding in me and my words abide in you. Because Romans 12, 2 tells us that when you spend time in the word, he is transforming you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And one of the transformations you begin to see, one of the transformations you begin to understand, just like the prodigal son, he waited, not realizing he never asked. And one of the other revelations he didn't do, he didn't realize it all belonged to him anyway. <laughs> Hear me, church. When you ask the Father in Jesus' name, you're not asking the Father for something that doesn't belong to you. You're not looking at empty and asking Him to fill it. You're not saying, hey, God, could you find something for me? Throw me a crumb. That's the servant mentality. That's when people start saying, I'll do, if you do this for me, God, I'll do this, this, and this. You can't barter with God. His stuff is too good. He, it's too good. You can't barter. Salvation is not bartering. You are saved by grace through faith and not by works lest any man should boast what, what is happening when we begin to understand when we begin to understand when we begin to understand that the name of Jesus empowers us in our covenant with God because you are saved by grace through faith you are son and daughter of the most high God so when you go ask God, Father I need We've taught you already, always have a, have a scripture. Because you receive by faith, Hebrews 6, 12, Hebrews eleven thirty three. Faith comes by hearing the word, Romans 10, verse 17. 
So you have, you have to have a scripture. You have to have whatever you're praying for. It has to be in the line with the promises of God. But the Bible says that the promises of God to you and me are yea and amen, which the King James says, approved and so be it. Do I have your attention? So when you begin to ask, we don't ask for what we don't have by position of our relationship with him. All right, let me break it down a little bit. Let me break it down a little better. Isaiah talks about the stripes of Jesus and that by his stripes you are healed. But 1 Peter 2.24 reiterates or repeats that, but changes something. It says, by whose stripes you were healed. So Peter's saying were, Isaiah's saying are. What's the difference? The separation in the timeline of this thing called the cross of Calvary. In the timeline of the cross of Calvary, before the cross, it was futuristic. At the cross, everything after is past. Because at the, cross of Je- at the cross of Calvary, Jesus took the stripes of sickness upon himself and taking it, destroying it, because sickness, Deuteronomy, is under the curse. Galatians 3, we've been redeemed from the curse by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Poverty's under the curse. Look it up, Deuteronomy. Sickness, lack is under the curse. Jesus became the curse, for cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that Galatians tells us, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentile. So what is happening? God is leapfrogging over the law of Moses. You've got to get into this. And you'll find out Hebrews and find out that what God did with Abraham before Moses and the law, he leapfrogs over that because the promises were to Abraham and his seed, Paul says. Seed being singular, not plural, referring to Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you are part of that seed and heirs according to the promise so God leapfrogs over it and what is happening at the cross of Calvary he purchased he purchased your salvation he paid for the price for you to be healed all the promises of God are yea and amen because it's all done in Jesus so when you say, God, I'm dealing with a sickness, I need you to heal me, you're looking future tense. But what will help us in a prayer is when we begin to see that you are healed, not because it's going to happen, it's already been purchased for you. You get a receipt from some, something, and you're like, man, where is that food, or where is that thing that you bought? you bought me? Here's the receipt. This shows on this day, on this time, I bought it. Well, I don't have it. It belongs to you. I dropped it off. I don't know where it's at. You can say, well, let's find it. What is it? Because you already own it. Why? Because you have the receipt. I'm telling you that the Word of God is your receipt in heaven. That when you approach the throne by the blood of Jesus, you can boldly stand. And when you are standing and saying, in the name of Jesus, what you're saying is, I have the receipt. You've already purchased for me. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. I am complete, the Bible says. That means nothing missing, lacking, or broken. You are complete in Him. When I begin to think about me, I get in the servant mentality. I don't ask. I start bartering all these years. I've been with you, Father, and I have never done anything against you. But you didn't give me anything. He had a servant mentality. Anybody who says, oh, I've been a Sunday school teacher for 20 years. I deserve to be healed if anybody's going to get it. I've had people say stuff like that. Oh, if anybody's going to get a blessing from God, it would be me. I pray more than anybody. Oh, all of a sudden, you think you've earned the right and the ability and the opportunity to receive something that you can't afford. You could be perfect your whole life, but you can't afford what God has. He's so good. Salvation by grace through faith. You say, well, that's salvation. The Greek word for salvation is soterior. It includes your blessing. It includes your healing. It includes your peace of mind. It includes the joy of the Lord. Everything is fulfilled in Jesus. So when I approach the Father in the name of Jesus and I ask him, if I go in the mentality of, God, I know I really don't deserve this, or God, I don't know how, I can, how you're going to do this, or you know what I'm doing? I'm working from position of me. I have to get me out of the equation. And the Bible says it's no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Don't you realize that you're an heir of God, joint heir with Christ? Don't you realize the Bible says that if he would not withhold his son, what other things would he withhold from you? You say, but I prayed. Maybe you prayed from the perspective of you. you got to take you and put it to the side. And you boldly approach the throne by the blood of Jesus and say, Father, I thank you that your word, the receipt from heaven, tells me that by the stripes, 1 Peter 2.24, I was, therefore I am healed. And I thank you, Father God, I'm reaching into the harvest of heaven. Didn't Jesus said, store up for yourself treasures in heaven? What do you say? Why would you store anything up in heaven? You don't need it when you get there. It's storing it up what your obedience to God gives you access. That's why God asks you to do something. It's not so you can earn it. It unlocks your obedience. And God, I give you permission. And God says, when you give me permission, I give you access to the, to the treasure chest of heaven. Father, I thank you that by your stripes of Je by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Can I go a little deeper this morning? This is more like a, this is more like a Wednesday night Bible study thing, but I, I, I think we can handle it. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? When you begin to dig in and get the transformation of your mindset, you begin to see things differently because the Bible tells us that you are, listen to me, you are a three-part person. You are a spirit. You have a soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions. And you live in a physical body. Say, so I'm a spirit. I have, a soul, I have a soul, and I live in a physical body. All three parts are important to salvation. Jesus purchased all three. That's why even if you die when he shows up, the Bible says the graves are going to open and those physical bodies are going to be translated and transformed and go up to heaven. Why? Because he's not letting anything go. Every fragment, if he purchased it, he wants it. But what if someone gets blown up? He's still a big God. He'll find the particles. He'll find the atoms. He'll find the Higgs boson. You don't even know what that is, but they said way down there. They found out the atoms, not the smallest. He'll, he'll find the, the elements that, that scientists haven't figured out, and he knows where everything's at, and he'll bring it together because the blood is purchased. Yeah. Say, I'm purchased by the blood of Jesus. Come on, shout, I'm purchased by the blood of Jesus. And when you understand that, all of a sudden you begin to have an understanding that who you are, the greatness of who you are, that greater is he that is in you, Romans 8. The greatness of God in you starts with the spirit man because your hair didn't change when you get saved. And some of your thinking didn't change. That's why you have to be renewed in the mind. That's why you got to work out your salvation. What God started on the spirit side of you. Bring it up. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. And when you, when you begin to understand this, that the, the priority of you, remember importance and priority? All three are important. We have to handle them correctly because if you don't handle one of them correctly, you run into problems. But all three want to be a priority. Your flesh wants to be the one that gets everything. It'll cry out. It'll give you desires. If you don't think your flesh has a voice, go on a three-day fast. Some of you don't have to go on three days. Go on a three-hour fast. Skip lunch, and you will hear the voice of your flesh. Why are you doing this? This is the dumbest thing. Why are we? I'm hungry. Someone will bring Krispy Kreme donuts today that day at work. Never did it before. The day you go on a fast, watch what happens. Why? Because your flesh has a voice. Your flesh wants to be a priority. Your soul has a voice. Your reasoning, you'll say, well, I know God said that, but you know what, it, it, maybe that was, and we'll try to be a priority. But when you allow the spirit side of you, where the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of you, when you be, allow to become that to become the priority, are you listening to me? Your spirit, man, can't get sick. So when you say, I am sick, what you are saying is, my priority of who I am starts with my flesh. Because your spirit, man, can never be sick. Woo! I think that was heavy. We'll have to chew on that for a little bit. Are you with me? Your spirit, man, can't be broke. And when you say, I am broke, I don't have, what you are saying is what you see in the dimension of the natural, and you made that the priority. 
God said to Abram, I want you not to be called the father of nations. I want you to go from Abram to Abraham, the father of a multitude, many nations. Let those who are weak say, I am strong. This is not mind over matter. This is the word over the matter. And you're getting an understanding of who you are. Lester Summerall, have you ever heard of Lester Summerall, old revivalist, Smith Wigglesworth, have you ever heard of him? Lester Summerall asked Smith uh, Wigglesworth one day, great revivalist, many people raised from the dead. He came to him one day and said, so how's Smith doing today? And he responded and said, I don't ask Smith how he's doing today, I tell him. <laughs> because if you let the important things rise to priority, you'll ask yourself, do I want to go to church? Do I want to read the Bible? Do I want to? See, we ask ourselves. It's amazing how people tell me they can't go to church or pray, but they're able to show up at work. Do you know why you can show up at work every day? You don't ask yourself. You set the alarm. You get your butt out of bed. You get yourself cleaned up, and you might not like it. You might not be celebrated, but you do what you know you have to do because you don't ask yourself. But when we come to things of God, we ask ourselves. We'll ask our body, how do you feel about this? We'll ask our mind, is anything good on TV today? We've allowed the, the, the important things to stretch to priority things. And when you allow that, the priority becomes wrong. But when you back up and say, wait a minute, and this might seem different, put it on the back burner, let God over the process of time reveal it to you. All is good. All is good. God loves you. We love you. Love us. Pray. We'll all pray for each other. But when you begin to understand the priority of who you are, that you really are a spirit that has a soul that lives in the body. And your flesh says, my arm is hurt. I'm not saying don't listen to doctors and be, don't use wisdom. That's not what I'm saying. But all of a sudden you have a perspective of instead of letting people give you sympathy of, oh, I'm so sorry that you're sick. I'm not sick. I cannot be sick. For by the strength, it's not saying I deny what my flesh is saying. It's saying I choose the priority of who God made me to be. You are a winner. You are an overcomer. You are the head and not the tail. Everything sounds 1-3. You put your hands to. It's blessed to the Lord. You have increased. Go Going in and coming out. The anointing of God gives you understanding. The eyes of your understanding are enlightened that you may know the exceeding greatness of his power and the inheritance that belongs to you. You'll start rising up within yourself. Wait a minute. My family told me I'm a loser, but God says I'm a winner. And when you hear the conflict of a situation, don't go to the natural for confirmation. Go to the receipt of the word. Well, you said this. I, I, am I talking to somebody today? I mean, this is throughout Scripture. When the 12 spies went to check out the promised land, 10 came back. And the, the 10 came back and said, there are giants in the land. It is good as Moses has said to us, but he didn't tell us there are giants in the land and we can't take them. Joshua and Caleb says, it is good, there are giants, but they are bread for us. We could get them. God will put them in our hands. Do you know what God said? God said to the ten who spoke, he called that an evil report. He didn't call it an evil report because it was an inaccurate report. Because in the world of knowledge and facts, it was accurate to the factual situation. Have you ever told somebody you shouldn't say that? Oh, I'm just saying the truth. They're not saying the truth. They're saying the facts of the momentary temporary situation. But they're talking about it as if it's finalized. That's why the Bible calls it temporal. Don't focus and build your life on the temporal. Build it on the eternal. Because the temporal can and will change. And so when the world tells you you're broke, you don't have to sit there and negate with them and talk about them. You don't have to respond to them. You know that you are blessed. And your bank account might not show it today. But you're on the journey and the process of faith. That's where you hear people, these ministers will get a revelation and they'll say, I can never be broke another day in my life. Why? Because they learn the identity of who they are in Christ. Yeah. If you want to study, go through the New Testament and find out every references of in him, in Christ, yeah. and find out who you are in Christ. Yeah. And God said, that's who you are. Yeah. 
Now you can believe a wicked report, which is what the world tells you you are temporarily. Or you can begin to say, I know what the doctor's saying. That's the temporary report. That doesn't take in consideration. The doctor says, no one has ever been healed. That's the doctor report. That's his understanding. That's the best he can do. But I know someone who is called the great physician. And I cannot take him out of the equation. And with God, all things are possible to those who believe. Didn't Jesus said to Mary Martha, didn't I tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. And I'm not believing because I feel it emotionally. I'm not believing because it looks practically. I'm believing because I got a revelation from the truth and the truth has set me free. Jesus said, continue in my word and then you shall know the truth and truth sets you free. If you are speaking truth and it imprisons you, it's not truth. It's a lie of the temporary. But when you get a hold of the eternal, you'll begin to understand that what you walk out by faith might not, might, might not make sense to everyone every friend and neighbor and family member but you can't get them to go with you sometimes you got to be like Abraham I love you but I got to move from you because where God has taken me does that make sense where are you going Abraham I don't know he I'm just following God how are you gonna get there I don't know I'm just following God why are you doing this Abraham I don't understand it all either you don't have to understand it you don't have to figure it out you just got to you just have to let the great chef of heaven make you a gourmet meal today and all you got to do is enjoy what he's bringing to you. Not because of you. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. Woo, it's all about Jesus. Someone says, do you think you deserve it? No, I don't deserve to get saved. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve to be forgiven. I don't deserve to have the peace of God. I don't deserve any of it. But it's the goodness of God that leads to me to repent. He's so good. He's so good. He's so good. I don't have to be paid like everybody I know. I don't have to live like everybody I know. I don't have to feel like everybody I know. I can tap it to the receipt of heaven. In Jesus' name. It's not about me. I already own it. I'm in Jesus. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Jesus said, I'm the, I'm the branch, you're the vine. Without me, you can do nothing. Why? Because it's all about Jesus. Well, I know somebody, and they tried that, and it didn't work for them. Well, who do you want to follow? Who do you want to follow? Well, what about this disciple? I'm not a follower of disciples. I'm a follower of Jesus. Praise God for all the things Peter did, but Peter also had some mistakes. I'm a follower of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Shout, I'm a follower of Jesus. Are we having fun today? Hallelujah. All right, here's my last verse. Are you ready? So when I begin to understand all that I would ever pray for that's in alignment with the Word of God, already belongs to me. If I can find it in the promise of the Word of God, it's already yours. Quit trying to barter. Quit trying to beg. Quit trying to cry for it. No, no. It's, say, it's already mine. It's legally yours. Now you got to make it literally in the manifestation. In the beginning, John 1, 1 was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But it was down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh. That which you are believing becomes materialized. That which you are seeing from the Word becomes able to be seen by those who don't know God. All right, here we go. Here we go. First John. Ooh, we're going long today, aren't we? I don't know. I'm looking at the time. First John. First John, I'm sweating, hallelujah. First John chapter 5. You ready? And this, King James translation, and this is the confidence. Have you ever looked at somebody who's praying for something and you look in their eyes and there was no confidence, there was just fear about the worst case scenario. And this is the confidence. Ooh, I'll tell you, when you're in faith, you are walking in confidence. You are having peace. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, which is alignment with what? His word. He does what? Talk to me, church. He does what? He does what? He hears you. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know what? That we have 
the petition that we desired of him. My confidence comes that if I'm asking or praying to the Father through the Son, by in alignment with the Word of God, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. I'm asking in alignment with the Word, and if I ask the Father something in alignment with the Word, I know He hears me. And if I know He hears me, I know I have what I've asked. Mark 11, 23, 20, uh, Mark 11, 24. And what's over you when you pray? Believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. You must believe you own it before you touch it. You must believe you own it before you touch it. You must believe you own it before you touch it. And when you get to the confidence of knowing that you have it, do you know what happens? You move into a place of peace, a place of rest. That's why the Bible says with thanksgiving, don't be anxious for anything, but with thanksgiving let every, every prayer, every request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which exceeds your understanding, will guard your heart, soul, and mind. Are you listening to me? I'm trying to close. Are you listening to me? We have to learn to rest in the reality of truth. Rest in reality. When I begin to ask the Father in the, in the name of Jesus, I'm saying it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. And here's the receipt. And if I know I'm asking in alignment with the Word, I can have confidence that He's heard me and that I own it. And when I own it, I can rest. Say rest. rest. Shout rest. Hebrews says that there was rest for the people of God, Israel. But because of their hard heart and unbelief, they could not enter into that rest, going to the promised land. They could not, even though it was prepared for them, they could not enter in because of their unbelief. And it says that that rest is still available. And that we should strive to enter into that rest. There is a rest for the people of God. The rest when it's no longer about you. It's all about Jesus. And when the devil says he ain't going to do it for you, he said, two ladies already done it. He, why would God do that for you? It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Talk to him about it. All I do is I am the recipient. I'm the receiver of something that's too good for me to do on my own. Because he is a good God. He is a good God. He is a good God. And when I ask in line with the word, I know. I have confidence. It's mine. I know it's mine like a woman who's pregnant all of a sudden they celebrate with the family surprise them we're pregnant and you can look and say where's the baby I know we're going a little deep today but we'll hang we'll... there's no you don't see the baby yet I'm just pregnant I said just pregnant see you either are pregnant or you aren't pregnant can I share your story real quick, you two ladies? So basically, here's a little story most people don't know. My brother, David, and his wife, Debbie, have been praying for grandkids. And on Christmas, without them knowing, they were going to get a surprise that someone was pregnant. But God is so good. That not only did they find out someone was pregnant, they found out two of them were pregnant at the same time, and nobody knew. So here, here sits Devin and Hannah and Jordan and Deva, and they're all excited about surprising the family, not knowing the other one's getting ready to surprise the family. What a, what a Christmas. The only thing I think is humorous is, you know, I mean, for Dylan, I mean, what do you give for a Christmas present at that point? It, you know, I mean, when your, your brother just announced him and his wife are pregnant, your sister just went and, and she announced she's pregnant and everybody's celebrating, what do you give? Here's earrings? I mean, what do you do with that? You, you should have just taken them back, got the money back, and just called it a day. They won't remember anyway, so. <laughs> but think about the celebration. But can you imagine if they celebrate, woo, you're going to be parents, you're a mom and dad, you're pregnant. Where's the baby? I don't know. The doctor just said we're pregnant. No, but we know enough that the baby is in her womb. You don't see it yet. Well, you don't look pregnant. I know I don't look pregnant now. But what is in my womb is still growing. Since we're on this mindset of an illustration analogy, we'll stick with that for spiritual. Because some of you guys are saying, I don't have a womb. I get it. Thank you, thank you, Leroy. But spiritually, imagine 
Each and every one of us have a womb. You get the ownership of, I have what God says I have. You don't have to tell everybody because people look at you and say, you're blessed. I don't see any change. You don't understand. It's not there yet, but it's in my It's growing. That word is getting, it's growing. That revelation, that rhema is growing. I'm walking out the process through faith and patience. Hebrews 6, 12 and Hebrews 11, 33. Do I inherit the promises of God? It's not an overnight thing. Quit looking for people to give you a quick, rich, overnight scheme. you got to begin to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Follow the Lord. Follow His Word. Let Him guide you. And all of a sudden, the Word becomes alive on the inside. Because Romans 10 tells us that we believe in the heart. Faith and believing is in the heart, not in the mind, in the heart. And people say, I don't see a healing yet. I don't see anything different because you're looking on the natural. There's something, there is life on the inside. That's all I can tell you. And right now, it might not be showing, but I feel it kicking. I feel it moving. I'm, my appetite's changing. My body, things are changing. My perspective's changing. Things are getting ready. My body's beginning to change a little because it's preparing me to become... I'm hungering things I didn't hunger for. I'm craving things that I didn't crave before. I'm disliking foods that I didn't dislike before. Something's changing because it's all preparing me for the birth of the life that's on the inside of me. Some of you are like, I don't know why I need to go to church more. Why do I need to read the Bible? Why do I need to stop going to that stuff? It's not because God's punishing you. He's preparing you. There's a life of the seed of God's Word, Matthew 13, Mark 4, that's been planted on the inside of your heart, and it's growing. It's moving, and all of a sudden, people might not see anything, but you're feeling it move. You're feeling it kick. You're feeling, you're starting to have hope. You're beginning to have some anticipation. You're beginning to come excited about your tomorrows and not dreading your tomorrow. You wake up looking for the hand of God and what God's going to do that man can't do. You're, you're beginning to feel the fulfillment of God. What people promised you, they could not fulfill in you. They, I'm telling ladies, listen to me. That God cannot do for you what Jesus can do for you. Don't you think getting married or being having a family, those are good things. But don't let the devil tell you. Don't let that man tell you that you'll be happy and fulfilled. Because as soon as he gets old, and it usually takes 24 hours. I'm telling on us. Because there's a fulfillment that only God can give you. The world, they're trying to make all these things a priority, but only Jesus. And all of a sudden, you got the seed of God's life. I spoke to somebody. I don't know who it was. Someone's like, some of you are like, I'm dumping the joker when I get home. But that seed becomes alive on the inside of you. It becomes moving. And all of a sudden, you become changing. And people start noticing you're acting a little different. What's happening? It's growing. And one day, in the process of time, in the fulfillment of time, you'll see what God started on the inside of you. Don't you dare abort the seed of God's word that's been planted in your room. Don't you let people talk you out of what God's doing. Don't you, you walk out of this place saying, I know what God is saying. You're going to run into three people probably that say, that don't make sense. The carnal things don't make sense. The spiritual things don't make sense to the carnal mind. They seem foolish. Don't you dare let the devil talk you out of it, rob you of it. And when he tries to get you to sit quietly and analyze it, say, I'm not moved by what I feel here or see. I'm moved by the Word of God. And the seed, the nature, the Word of God is on the inside. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Wow, I think we just, we just preached a whole series in one message. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We're done. I'm telling you, when you get this in your heart, Matthew 13 and Mark 4, that you are a garden that God can plant the seed of his word, even when enemies are around you, you'll begin to wake up that you might have thought you lost your opportunity. But in God, the best is yet to come. And if everybody talks about you and leaves you and turns on you and ridicules you and stops being your friend on Facebook, God forbid, I'm telling you, you can stand strong and be a light and they will come back to you repenting. Nobody like Jesus. Nobody like Jesus. Nobody like Jesus. He can take a blind man and let him see.
He can take a lame man and get him to run and jump and praise God. He can take a woman who's never had children and have multitude kids. He can take a poor man and make him rich. He can take a person who's failed and make him king. He can take a man in a pit and make him the second most powerful man in the kingdom of... Just, don't you look at the pit of today like Joseph. And say, I'll never get anywhere. No, you're destined for a palace. You're destined for kingdom authority. You're destined to reign. You are destined to be ruler. You are destined to rule over your world. You are not a victim. You are not a pauper. You are not a sissy. Rise up, man of God. Rise up, woman of God, in the strength of who you're called to be. Hallelujah. Give him a praise of you. The next 30 seconds, give him a shout unto the Lord. A noisy, loud shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Ah, uh, the Holy Spirit's working on somebody right now. John, I'm moving. We're going to wait. The Holy Spirit's working on somebody's heart right now. I'm not moving. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The best days are not behind you. The best days are not behind you. All that you have is not all you're going to have. The best days are yet to come. The best days are yet to come. We got to quit thinking like the world thinks. You may be seated. I'm talking to somebody. You'll see stuff on TV and say, man, I wish I had made it that level. No, no, don't worry about them. You do it God's way. He'll give you power to get wealth. The hell add no sorrow to it. They won't find you five years down the road, drugged out, messed up, dying on a deathbed because you've just blown up your life because you didn't know. No, 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 no. God brings increase. Uh, if you've ever heard of this one ministry, they're both, the couple are both in heaven now, but Charles and Francis Hunter, back in the 80s and 90s, had one of the, uh, what became a world-renowned ministry. But what most people don't realize is they didn't get saved till later in life. They didn't start their ministry till they were 65. When most people were thinking about retiring, they were just starting. And they built a ministry that went around the world. Don't let the devil talk you out of what God has for you. The world will say it's too late. That's what they said to Abraham. That's what they said to Sarah. That's what they said. To, it's too late. But God said, too late for them. Now let me do what I can do. Amen. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking you if you know about God or, or to join a church or denomination. If you're here today and do not have a real relationship, the way you understand, the way you process, the way you experience, that you would know that Jesus Christ is real and that he's your personal Lord and Savior. Only you can answer that. If you're sitting here today and you're empty on the inside and everything you try is not giving you fulfillment, it's because you're missing Jesus. Only he can fill that space. If you're living with the dark cloud, guilt and pressure, that's the enemy of because your past sins. But 1 John 1, 9 says that if you repent and confess your sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse you, forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Revelation 3 says he stands at the door and knocks. If you hear his voice and open up, he'll come in. Romans 10 tells us with the heart man believes, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let this prayer I'm about to lead you in. If you do not know him, let it come from your heart. Watch what Jesus and only Jesus can do. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I turn to you today. I repent of all my sins. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me and on the third day rose again for me because I believe that I ask you Jesus to come into my heart wash me in your blood forgive me cleanse me give me a fresh start 
Say, Jesus, I don't want a religion. I want a real relationship with you. So I ask you right now, as I open up the door of my heart and life, I invite you in to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you say, Pastor, that might be for other people, but one thing I know that prayer today was for me. God's answered that prayer. Just so I know who I was praying with at the count of three, which is simply lift your hand and look me in the eyes. One, two, three, Pastor, that was for me. Thank you, sir. I see the hand, the second hand, the third hand. God bless you. Anybody else over here? That fourth hand, God bless you. Anybody over here? I don't want to miss that fifth hand, sixth hand, God bless you. Seventh hand, eighth hand, God bless you. Ninth hand, thank you. Ten, eleven, God bless you. Anybody else? Thirteen, thank you. Fourteen, God bless you. Fifteen, God bless you. So important. Sixteen, God bless you. You know what the Bible says? If one celebrates in heaven, how many people think we need to give a, a roar of praise for the sixteen that just gave their heart to the Lord? Come on. 